I'm guessing all of you guys are here because you're interested in starting your own companies. Is that true? Like, is that like nod, heads raised? Okay. Um, so I think we might end up making this more of a conversation since like we're, we have a slightly smaller crowd. Um, so I'm going to like whip through my slides really quickly so you can know who I am and like why, why you might want to listen to me. Um, and I, I, the biggest reason why is that, um, so I graduated from um, Tepper School of Business in 2016, which means I like three years ago, I was one of you guys. Um, and I founded this company, Blast Point, as a, in, in Dave Mooney's own class, um, which I think it was called uh, uh, Entrepreneurship for um, Early Stage Ventures. I think it's called Lean Entrepreneurship now. Um, so I, I founded my company in that class class. I'm my co-founder in a Connects workshop, um, very similar to this one. Um, and Dave made me pitch because he knew he could pick on me. And it was one of the best things that ever happened to me because my co-founder said, aha, that sounds like a good idea. And we ended up forming a team for the McGinnis Venture Competition and winning. And that was how we funded our company from the beginning. So really, um, my company, I don't think, would exist without our relationship with the Tepper School of Business and honestly, the 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 Swartz um, Center for Entrepreneurship. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we do um, and where we are right now. Um, and then I'd be happy to answer any of your questions um, about how we took a, basically a class project and an idea and made it into a company um, that serves literally uh, in global companies. Um, we have uh, a global car maker. We've got um, the largest um, utilities in the United States. I've got a dozen retail brands. So, you know, my customers touch millions of people's lives. Um, and so it means that through our software platform, we have a chance to really change things and, and, and uh, make the world, if not a better place, at least a more interesting one. Um, so let me tell you about what we do. Um, so... Basically, what we do is we build uh, portable AI systems um, that can be used by anybody in a company. Um, and uh, the AI modeling we build using data from our data partners. And uh, we, fuck, we mainly go after uh, marketing, sales, um, customer service, HR teams. And what we do is we optimize anywhere, any touch point where your organization talks to one of your customers. Um, so if you're a utility, it could be um, during billing. It could be during um, uh, outreach for um, weatherproofing your home. It could be when you don't pay your bill. Um, and what we do is we use um, AI-driven technology to shape how you how our customers talk to their customers and make their messaging and their outreach as effective as possible. Um, and the coolest thing that we're doing right now is um, we are um, electrifying the fleets and the vehicles of Alberta, Canada. So we're helping um, the ATCO, which uh, mainly um, serves that entire province. It's 100,000 miles larger, uh, square miles larger than Cal the state of California. There's 175,000 businesses and our software is being used to understand what businesses are going to be likely to put on public private charging and um, take their conventional fleets and make them into electrical vehicles. Um, so it's, it's been really interesting, really fun. Um, and, you know, just to talk really quickly about our products. So um, I just want to talk about one specific case. Um, so this is for people's natural gas um, uh, here in Pittsburgh. Uh, and what happened last year was they set this really ambitious goal of moving people to uh, e-billing uh, e from paper billing and uh, it was September and they knew they were not going to hit their goal and everybody's bonuses were at stake so people were kind of flipping out a little bit. Um, so they ended up calling us and we put a system in place in about three weeks that, that helped fix their problem and basically what we did was we took everybody um, who had not yet um, switched to e-billing and we found two key what we call persona groups um, of people who were most likely to respond to the messaging and we built two campaigns essentially, or our system automatically built two campaigns that our, our customer use. So one for um, younger people, higher income, really care about the environment. Um, so they built a digital campaign for those people. And there are, there's an older set of people who were a little bit more cost conscious, um, uh, were the kind of people who would open their mail, and they ended up doing a direct mail campaign. Um, and they were able to um, bump their numbers about 5% historically in just a couple of weeks, which ended up saving them about $1.3 million. Um, so those are the typical kinds of pro projects that we do. 
Um, and, you know, our whole system is about, okay, who's going to adopt um, technology or adopt programs? Um, who's, who are the innovators? Who are the people who are going to do it really early? Who are the people who are um, going to be in the fat part of the curve? But honestly, more importantly, um, understanding who's never going to adopt certain kinds of technology. Um, you know, if you think about our case in Alberta, Canada, there's 175,000 businesses there. Um, are all of them going to adopt electrical vehicle charging? No, not by far. And knowing which ones are not going to do that means you know exactly who not to call. And our customer has uh, six salespeople um, to cover the entire province. And so knowing what not to do is just as important as knowing what to do. Um, Huh, looks like my, my images are not coming through. Um, but, uh, you know, just to, to let you know, like we, we have like a, a whole slew of, um, of uh, solutions that are part of our entire platform. Um, and, you know, one of the things we're able to do along with serving utilities and transportation companies and these big corporations is that we can also be free or low cost to nonprofits. We serve more than four dozen, um, including um, uh, the, you know, the Pittsburgh Flu Food Blank, um, Three Rivers Youth, um, and uh, the uh, Wounded Warrior Project. Um, so it's, it's really cool that we're able to, to basically build this technology and then we can give it away for free for people who are uh, serving the people of Allegheny County and honestly, the, you know, our nation as a whole. Um, so just a little bit more about us. So this is me and my co-founder. Um, so I am a graduate of Tepper School of Business in the School of Computer Science. Um, my co-founder is an expert in um, uh, machine learning and computer vision. He got his master's degrees from um, ECE. So we're both um, technical co-founders, which it just means things are a little bit easier. Um, like being a software company is easier than a hardware company because like I don't have to worry about things existing in the physical world. Um, and the marginal cost of my software is just like whatever it, it costs for me to put it in my customers' hands. Um, and us being um, technical co-founders meant that, you know, not only were the people, we the business people in our, our companies, we were the, you know, we were almost like the manufacturers as well. Um, so he built the front end of the system, I built the back end. Um, so, you know, just to let you know a little bit more about our, our background. So Tomer actually taught um, the cross-platform web apps uh, course here at CMU, um, which has been very good for us having that expertise. Um, and, you know, he's built a company that that was um, purchased by Apple. I built, I built one that was uh, purchased by Xylem. Um, he's a new green card holder. So one of the things we've learned, had to learn how to navigate is uh, immigration. Um, so I'd be happy to answer questions about that. Um, we, we ended up putting in a, a wide ranging um, <laughs> strategy around that, but he ended up marrying somebody, so that made everything a lot easier. Um, but I ended up, uh, we, we, we filed, we have uh, patents that we filed. I have no regrets in filing those patents, but part of the reason was so that we could do that, so that was so that we could say that he is uh, someone of uh, extraordinary ability, which has a special visa. Um, and I'll answer more questions about that if you guys have questions about it. Um, you know, me, myself, um, I have over 12 years um, experience building um, software, um, specifically in the big data analytics and banking um, space. Um, I pioneered a lot of the really early um, algorithms for building geospatial big data systems. Um, so I have um, really extensive experience in that. I'm also um, uh, have a, a great deal of experience in natural language processing. Um, I'm really good at filling out paperwork and winning scholarships. Um, and uh, so as I said before, we started in 2016 as a class project. Um, after we won the beginners competition, we spent about a year interviewing 100 potential customers, basically anybody who would talk to us um, to make sure that we actually had a market for the system because we did um, the opposite of what they say you should do all the time, which is well, we built technology and then tried to find a problem to solve with that technology. And they always say that you should do the opposite. I'm sure you guys hear it over and over again, um, where you should be interviewing customers and then only building technology in those interviews. I'm going to say we didn't do that. Um, but one of the things we did do was interview people to make sure that they would actually, so people are super nice. I'm going to talk about this a little bit later and basically hearing through the niceness to an actual, is this an actual business with something really important that we had to do. Um, we originally served um, economic development organizations 
organization. So these are organizations that are, um, I don't know if you guys know this, but pretty much every city, every county, um, many towns um, have um, organizations within them. And their whole job is to fight to death to bring um, uh, businesses and jobs to their local area. So if you think about, uh, uh, for example, um, Kansas City. So Kansas City actually has, is split between two states, Missouri and Kansas. And the two sides of the city, since they're in separate states, are just constantly in death matches, um, uh, giving out, uh, you know, for example, tax breaks to get manufacturers from one side to the other so they can benefit from um, the, the tax benefits that, that these employers bring. Um, and there's about, I don't know, 40,000 of these organizations in the United States. Um, we serve ones across six states. Um, and that was where we started. Um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about our journey um, in expanding our customer base. Um, and, but, you know, as I said before, we, we serve companies that have millions and millions of customers. We end up working with really, really big data. Um, um, so, you know, our first sources of funding, so our very first uh, dollars came from the McGinnis Venture Competition. Um, we ended up getting um, an equity stake from Alpha Lab um, when we, we joined their incubator soon after that. Um, we won um, the UpPrize competition. I think uh, uh, the Sports Center has a pretty good track record in that because I think Talk Me Up won last year's. Um, and that was really how we were able to fund the company. Um, everyone always talks about friends, family, and fools, but honestly, that means you know that you know rich people uh and i grew up in a really poor town um with my parents are you know grew up really really poor um and you know my my co-founder was in the same situation and so we didn't have people who would basically open up their checkbooks for us so all, our alternative was getting really good at t telling our story, uh, talking about what we do, and using that to win competitions, um, which is how we funded our company. Um, and we also ended up getting um, another 25K and matching funds from Innovation Works for winning the Upprice competition. Um, so this is how we, we like first got our start. This is how Tomer was able to quit his job. I kept mine for uh, a really, really long time um, and worked every evening, every weekend. Um, my kid had a dollhouse in my desk. Um, so uh, I did everything I could basically to make sure that when I quit my job, I wasn't going to, I was going to be able to contribute uh, as much as possible. And we were going to keep the company alive for as long as possible, because I don't know if you guys know this about uh, uh, startups, they run out of money really quickly. Um, and sometimes like it seems like our whole goal in life is just to get enough money from whatever source we can so that we stay alive for as long as possible um but right now we just closed a 1.3 million dollar seed round which means we're actually set for the next year um so i'm off that treadmill for at least like a little bit um and most of our money came from angels accelerators um angel funds vc firms um and being solvent means that I have time to develop our technology. Um, I can say no to things that I think won't be good for our company in the long run. So I have, you know, a company in Switzerland, for example, that wants us to help um, determine whether trucks are driving illegally on a street. And that's honestly not what we do, um, which means I'm, and honestly, it's like, it's, it's a solution that would work maybe in that one location, maybe in a couple of others, but it's not what the main idea of our company is. And it means that we're not diluting our mission we're not diluting the software we're building i'm not maintaining software that's not on our central mission because i have this money so i can say no to technology that might be a brilliant idea but it's just not what's going to be the right idea to make us the big company i know we can potentially be so we always talk about the power of no in the company um and so it's the power of no to say things to things that aren't on your you know your central pathway um you know your vision for where you want to be but also saying no to like companies that you don't think are good for your brand or no to investors who you think are going to be more trouble than they're worth um and you know i hate to say it but there's more investors like that out there than you'd expect um um, and so right now we've got 12 people, um, nine full-time, um, and three part-time, um, uh, other than, you know, having enough money to keep the company alive. Uh, the other thing that we're really concerned with since we're a software company is um, it means we're in a human capital business. And so everything I do is to make sure my, my staff is happy. I get to keep them. I compete with Facebook and Google um, for employees. And so being able to differentiate ourselves is really important. Um, and even for people who aren't developers, we make sure we pay a living wage. Um, you know, we, we have health insurance now. Um, we make sure that our staff members have equity 
equity. And we, so we use vesting to incentivize people to stay with the company as long as possible. Um, the other thing I don't do is um, I don't like using contractor status for actual employees uh, because it's basically like making my employees pay my taxes for me. And we have resources, so we don't do that. Um, and it just means that everybody's on W-2s. It also helps my insurance because we have really intense cybersecurity insurance. Um, and that means uh, that uh, I don't... If, if you're not my employee and you're my contractor, you have to have your own cybersecurity insurance if you're going to touch my code base, um, which makes it really hard to hire good contractors. So I'd rather just hire people and have them be on my staff and have them be covered uh, directly by my insurance. Um, so here are our locations. So we're in East Liberty, really close by. Um, and we've also um, uh, been lucky enough to be included as members of the plug and play um, accelerator. So we're actually in the Silicon Valley um, um, energy cohort right now. We're also in the one in Houston. Um, and if you guys don't know what plug and play is, um, it's really great. Um, so uh, they don't take any equity up front um, and they don't take any money up front. And basically what they do is they connect you with fortune 1000 companies um, and their innovation teams. And they basically help you get through these really, really big corporations. So, um, you know, it could be anybody um, from Chevron to McDonald's to Coca-Cola um, to uh, Hyatt Regency, um, these gigantic brands. And um, usually they won't take your phone call. Um, but if you join plug and play um the way that that plug and play you know uh, keeps themselves alive is um so the the these big companies pay for access um to the the uh startups which are us and we're, we basically end up being um decentralized innovation teams for these corporations so that they can have access to innovation in ways that can be really hard for really big companies um and the other thing is that if we do really well then plug and play and we'll invest and it's actually a really great way to do deal flow um, which means that you get access to really you know a bunch of companies that look really good you put them in this crucible and you see how they perform and if they per only if they perform well do you end up investing in them and it I, I, honestly i think it's really brilliant um and the way they they've put it together and they've got locations all over the world there's even um i think uh, uh, a location in cleveland we need one here in pittsburgh um but uh, uh for us it's been a really really good experience um, so just to give you an idea of our process for expanding markets, so we started out in nonprofits and community and development. Um, and the really nice thing about them is that they were willing to take chances on us. Uh, and so we ended up building our first um, few dozen customers there. Um, from there, we moved into retail and franchise. So, you know, the starter market, they could only pay us a little bit of money. The retail and franchise folks could pay us a little bit more. Um, and our utilities and enterprise markets, they can pay us enough for us to um, really make money, really put our technology out there. Um, and so, uh, you know, a lot of people, you know, I, I feel like sometimes the advice is like, go after this first. And for us, we needed like trust points, we needed proof points. And so we needed basically to find anybody who would have us um, do things really excellently for them and move up from there. And fortunately, the software platform that we built is really the same across all of these verticals. Um, there's a lot of things in common um, about how they work with our geospatial data and our AI data. And it means that we're not developing separate solutions for all of these markets. So if we were, this would be a much more difficult uh, 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 problem to get over. But for us, since we were able to do that with our software, we had a lot more leeway about how we put our markets together and how we end up um, pricing and delivering our, our systems. Um, yeah, and th this is what I wanted to come back to is uh, when you're doing customer discovery, um, people are super nice. And that's one of the things you kind of have to get over when um, getting good discovery information. And what you want to see in customer discovery is like, uh, maybe you want to figure out exactly what the product is you need to build. But you also need to see if, if this is a, a potential business area that will make money. And People, when you show them technology, are usually very, very nice. And they'll say, this looks so good. You're doing such a good job. You're going to be so rich. It's wonderful. But they won't buy it. Um, and having somebody who's going to buy something, you know, please take my money. How much does it cost? When can I have it? When you hear those things, 
only should you be diving into that product. And for us, we ended up um, interviewing over 100 people across 20 different verticals. Not everybody said this stuff. Um, and once we were able to talk to the right people, so we found the right market, um, and we were able to tweak our product and honestly, like tweak our messaging around our product, I've been really shocked at how much marketing really makes a difference in people's interest in software. Um, so the words you use around things really makes a difference. Um, and so if you can figure out what those things are, do it by talking to people. And I, and one of the tricks we learned and, and how we were able to talk to more than a hundred people was every person we talked to, we were like, great, thank you so much for that information. Can you introduce us to three more people um, who are, you know, at your level or, you know, in your industry or in an industry that's adjacent. And that that was how we got introduced to so many people. We also used all of our Tepper resources. So just getting really shameless at walking up to people after talks, um, getting them to not only talk to us, but getting them to inter introduce us to more people. It's been really important for us to understand our product market fit and make sure that we have the right, not only the right software, but in the right product, um, but we're selling it to the right people and we're talking to the right people in the org structure. Um, so for our, like our go to market really quick, um, um, where it is right now. So before we started out with almost completely networking. Um, so, you know, CMU innovation works, um, plug and play, just getting as many introductions as we possibly can. Um, from there, we, ex we expanded to trade shows. Mostly we started out just attending them this year. We've been to seven shows with two booths, um, and trade shows are, are really good for B2B. I, I guess, uh, let me just put it, put it out there. Um, it really depends on the industry and banking going to trade shows is not great um, because decision makers don't always show up at um, the trade shows you're going to go to. But for utilities, they're great um, because C-level people, decision makers show up all the time. And when you go to a trade show, you know that you're there to buy stuff. You're basically shopping. Um, and that's just a really, really different environment than when you're cold calling. Um, and so for us, they've been really effective. We also do pull marketing and we don't get as many customers directly from pull marketing, but we, we do is we cultivate customers that way. So they can see us develop products. Um, they can see us um, and our messaging and where other customers are using us. Um, asking people to use their imaginations is really, really hard. So if you can meet them where they are as much as possible and you know, you know you're doing a good job um, when you tell the story of one of your customers and another new potential customer comes up to you and says, oh, I have the exact same problem. Um, and when you do that, it's just like the best thing. Um, and for us, that's how we've been driving a lot of our leads lately. Okay, so that's our story. Um, and, you know, I thought I'd get to this pretty quickly because I'm sure you guys are in a similar place to where we were. Um, and I wanted to make sure that we have a lot of time for questions. So um, does anybody have anything they want to ask? I have a question. Uh, I just started with the I. Uh, uh, sorry, the visa status and stuff. Uh, can you elaborate more on that? Sure. So my my co-founder. Um, so it's a lot easier when somebody's in a STEM field because you get a little bit more time um, uh, through the, the visas postgraduate. So we were able, um, we ended up signing up for, um, what's that program called? Um, uh, not, he did OPT, but um, as a company, we had to sign up uh, for... Uh, did you give an AB1 or an OPT? So, so I, that part I didn't have to take care of as much. Um, so I'm trying to remember what we signed up for. Um, it's through uh, uh, immigration. Like basically, we have to fill out a bunch of paperwork and say like we are an, an employer of repute. Um, and you know, sorry. No, gosh, I like I get emails from them on a daily basis, and I'm trying to remember what it is. Um, uh, I'm sorry that I'm blanking on this, um, but we basically ended up signing up through them, filling out the paperwork, um, keeping him um, in the country for as long as possible. So he's um, an Israeli citizen. Um, so I, depending on what country you're from, things can be easier or harder. Oh, there was a specific question, like, for example, I graduate uh, in December 2020, and I want to work on my own startup. Um, we need a... Uh, 
basically your F1 expires <laughs> and if it continues as OT, OPT if we have a job, right? Yep. Um, so how does it work if we are doing our own startup? Um, like you sign up for a specific program with the with um, immigration, and you basically um, you and you tell U.S. immigration that like I'm not just some guy. I'm incorporated. So you have to be incorporated first of all, um, and second of all, uh, once you do that, you can sign up with this program, um, and then once you can do that, you can actually sponsor people through their OPT, which is what we did. Um, and then um, you know beyond the OPT, you've got a couple of options for visas. So um, you know the easiest thing is spousal visa but like you know you should only do that if you're if you actually want to marry somebody um but otherwise there's sort of two options that we really looked at so we looked at h1b um which is a lottery um for the employer just as much as it is for the people who are trying to get the h1b um the other thing we looked at is there are special visas for people of extraordinary ability i think they're the i want to say f1 but i don't think that's right um thank you um and there's a couple of things that you can do to help um that process. So your, your startup is going to have to hire a lawyer. If that's the case, like you are going to have to have um, a little bit of money behind you to uh, fulfill that process. Um, but it, it's, uh, it, you know, it, it, it's basically, if you can prove that uh, you are someone who has unique skills, it'll help you stay in the country. And it, it's a lot easier if you're STEM, because if you're STEM, you can basically say, well, I do, um, you know, I'm building software systems that are um, good for the national security of the United States. Um, and they tend to be, there's a lot of leeway around that. Um, you can also um, file patents um, and... Uh, excuse me, um, uh, you know, there's also like an art side of it, um, you know, where you, you can show e extraordinary ability in other ways, but like we're all entrepreneurs here. So it's, it's mainly about the business side of it. Um, and for me, I made sure that like we had patents filed for my, my uh, co-founder just in case, like he's happily married right now, but just in case anything happened, I needed to make sure that if we had to make the case for um, this extraordinary ability visa that we had our documentation in place ahead of time, um, Patents are good for many other reasons, but that was definitely one of the reasons why we made sure that we filed them when we filed them. Does your partner have any publications either? I think he might. He, he definitely has a couple on his CV. Um, and he also built technology that ended up um, being sold to Apple. Um, and so there was, uh, it was a little bit of, uh, easier of a case to, to talk about like the, the overall value of that potential uh, 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 software he built. It was all about um, speaking and listening uh, software, which again could have, you could argue has national security important. Just to follow up on that. Um, so you mentioned that you were working uh, on on a job as well as doing a startup. So for an immigrant, uh, immigrant that will mean an H1B and working on a startup, how does that uh, working in two rooms uh, work out for you? And so it's one of those things that's like, if I had to do it again, I wouldn't, but I'd really love to never do that again in my entire life. Um, and it's basically, um, you end up working just every single holiday, every sick day, every every weekend, every, in almost every evening. So I, I had a toddler, um, and I was doing this at the same time, and it was really, really hard. I think my lowest point was like I came in and I worked all weekend, and I was just filing 1099s, and I filed our taxes, and it was, so I didn't get make any progress on sales, and didn't make any progress on building our system. I just did paperwork. Um, you know, it's paperwork to keep the company alive and keep the company functioning and, you know, compliance. Um, but at the same time, it was just like, I'm spending all this time and I didn't even get anything done. This, you know, it didn't feel like getting anything done that whole weekend. And so that was really, really hard. Um, and what I was able to do was um, argue that I was really valuable at my company. And so what I did was I went from being full-time and then tapering down to, to part-time until I was about at 10 hours a week. They had a really hard time replacing me because I, I I, I do this special kind of product management um, that also involves um, like a software engineering process improvement. Um, and so my, my job luckily worked with me on this a lot. So I was able to, you know, do almost two years um, doing both jobs as much as I possibly could. And I know my co-founder was really, really lonely, but if I hadn't had the co-founder, I don't think the company would have survived um, because just having one person doing that and juggling both jobs, it was demoralizing at times. So, um, 
I definitely wouldn't recommend doing it unless you've got a partner who's, if not dedicated to, to it full time, something close to that, just so that you can make progress even while you're doing your other job. So the, the whole problem is that if you're on an F1, it expires as soon as you graduate and you need a job to stay back. Uh, you can register as working employee if your startup is registered. So that means either I have to pick up a job in a job uh, for the law in a startup that has been established. It can be mm -hmm. my own startup, but it has to be established by someone who is a citizen. Yep. Okay. Um, and that's how I show that I am employed and that's what I'm saying. Exactly. Yeah, I'm trying to. Boy, I'm like, I need to get my phone and just like look up what this because uh, it's a it's a system that you basically the, the paperwork's not hard, but it basically uh, lets the Department of Immigration recognize you as an employer and someone who uh, employs people with visas. Um, so not everybody has to sign up for it, but we ended up doing it so that when my my co-founder did his OPT, it we had all of our ducks in a row. Yes. Um, I'm curious, how did you build the product from then? What was the process for building the product and then finding your target audience? How did you navigate that? So I guess the product wasn't built entirely in a vacuum. Um, so I was working for another company. Um, so they, they were Ryza Labs. Um, they were eventually bought by Nielsen. Um, and I was working on stuff for Ryza. And there's a few things where I was like, this doesn't seem exactly right. Um, so it was like the, 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 the products we were building were for researchers. And they were really neat products. Um, but at the same time, researchers are incredibly hard people to build things for. Um, they are really particular about how everything works. They will check your math like to the like to the tenth decimal point. Um, and but they don't always have a ton of influence in larger organizations. And the longer I worked with researchers, the more I realized the people I was actually serving were salespeople. And the more time I spent with salespeople, I realized they just thought about things really differently. So we needed an entirely different product with a you know entirely different framework around it. And I had an idea of how that it could the, a way that it could work that was not based on like numbers and data, and more it, it based on basically giving people. Um, an idea of what the most lucrative thing to do next would be. Um, and so I had an idea for the system um, and it was based on my own industry experience. But, but at the same time, uh, you know, we started building it without doing interviews. Um, you know, because we could. Um, and um, so I was a developer, my co-founder was a developer. So what we did was we basically built um, you know, this model view controller. I, 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 I'm talking about design patterns right now, which are pretty standard in um, software engineering. But for us, it was a way for us to divide up the code base so that um, each of us could take a piece of the system, work on it separately, and we just had APIs that spoke to each other. So it meant that as long as we had our documentation straight, uh, and the documentation trait was really just us talking over Slack um, and uh, just making sure that like when he pinged my API, he got what he expected. And, uh, you know, I, I when he pinged my API I, and he gave me objects, they were the way that I expected them to be. And as long as we got that straight, um, we could both build our pieces of the system separately. And we'd have, you know, sessions where we got together and we'd, you know, whiteboard exactly what it should look like. But we ended up developing the system entirely separately. But we were able to build something that actually worked within three months. Um, and that was in time. So, you know, it's, it's McGinnis Venture Competition time now. So we, uh, between like us entering and us finishing, we actually had a working prototype product that did everything that we said it was going to do. Um, and it was just because we had two developers on, on the team that we were able to manage that. Um, and, you know, I know it's a tall order sometimes because not everybody walks in here with skills like that. But if you can get a co-founder with that kind of skills and you can support them in every way possible from, you know, shoulder rubs to bringing them sandwiches, um, that, that's one way to accomplish what you need to accomplish immediately. Why did you start doing the user testing? So we won the McGinnis Venture Competition. I'm going to admit, there's like a real thing um, that we did for McGinnis was that um, we ended up picking a market because basically for, for McGinnis, you need to talk about what market you're going to go into. And after like the second round of stuff, it was really clear it was not the right market. But we were like, okay, we're going to keep doing research on this. We're going to understand this is the right thing. But if we keep going with this company, 
we can't, we can't stay in this market. It was restaurants. Like restaurants are so hard to sell into um, because it's like any small um, or medium sized business. Everybody, nobody has time to do anything. Um, and everybody's really uh, cost conscious. So they don't like, even if it's, you're charging like $50 for your, uh, your software, which seems like nothing at this point. Um, uh, they don't want to spend that money. They want it for free. Um, and for us, like one of the things we decided from the beginning was that we are never giving our product out for free. Um, if you want this product, you will pay for it. Um, and that was one of the things we stuck to from the beginning. Um, and so we ended up interviewing a bunch of customers. Um, so McGinnis, I think we won in April. We ended up um, interviewing customers through December, which is when we entered Alpha Lab. Um, and so we had about eight months of customer interviews by the time we were done with that. And we we refined the product a little bit. Um, but honestly, once that December hit, um, my co-founder quit his job. So he was actually like from uh, w once we went to McGinnis, we sat on the money for a long time and did these interviews to make sure that there was an actual business. Um, at the end of those eight months, he quit his job um, and went full time on, the, on the, the company. We were able to build a work like an actual working system, not just like a like a demo, like something we could actually sell in a month, um, which is him working full time on it. And then we were in market two months after that. So we had our first sale in February. Um, and, you know, for us getting to like, there's nothing that proves what you're doing more than having somebody pay you for it. Um, and, you know, it doesn't matter. It, it, like investors can be like, I think this is a terrible idea. This is never going to work. They will be quiet the second you start selling things, especially if you can sell things at scale. Um, just to follow up uh, on uh, the plan question there that, um, you said that you first developed your product and then uh, like founded the market. So uh, my question is like, especially you were working in big data. You don't know the data that you're collecting or working with what are markets it's applicable to and especially tweaking your product can make significant changes. So can you talk about more about how you did, uh, did that customer discovery in the second phase and realize like how how did you work the ideas of different markets? Sure. So what we ended up doing was basically hoarding as much data as possible because um, we didn't know what who would want what. And basically, anytime we found public data or we could make private data partnerships, we basically like took that and put it in our little like uh, you know uh, squirrel hoard um, and just build it up as much as possible. Um, and when we started talking to customers, it, it was pretty clear what they needed. And what was really kind of interesting is that um, we were talking to people across just so many different verticals. Um, and they all said, like 80% of the time, it was the same thing over and over and over again. And once you hear those 80%, like you know exactly what the important stuff is. And for us, um, since we were talking about customer analytics, people are people, no matter what, um, uh, you know, where you are, what vertical you're in. Um, and so for us, we could basically build the same data sets and we could either sell them or release them across um, a bunch of different verticals and they would all make sense. Can you talk a little about raising your series A and uh, seeing new connections or what you guys did to make that happen? So I guess the, the series we raised, is, I don't think it would count as an A. So it's a a seed or a pre-seed. I don't know what people call things anymore these days. So what we did was we raised on a convertible note. Um, and do you guys know what a convertible note is? So a, a convertible note is basically where I, instead of giving out shares, I give out debt. And if you guys are you know, in business school, you know when somebody goes bankrupt, who ends up first in line? It's the debt holders instead of the equity holders. Um, and so it's a little bit less risky for the people you're giving it out to. Um, but what happens is if there, when there's a certain funding event, that debt converts into shares. Um, and uh, so all of our, our investors, other than um, in, like a one slice from Innovation Works, they're 100 percent on um, this convertible debt. Um, and the nice thing about that is unlike a Series A, we set the terms. So we can say, here's um, you know what we're going to offer. Here's the cap. Here's um, you know, the interest rate we're going to offer. I guess these days you, you don't really do notes with interest rate as much, but when we were doing it, it was around 8% interest. Um, you know, Here's a discount from one round to another. Um, and we get to set those terms, not anybody else. Um, and that was a really nice thing about it. And so for us, um, since we were in good shape, we were able to say, take it or leave it to a lot of people. And honestly, like I was planning on raising 500,000 and then my friends 
who are entrepreneurs talked me into raising more than that. So I was like, fine, 800,000. Um, and then as soon as I raised the 800,000, I, you know, I ended up going to a couple of um, investor events and being like, I don't want any more money. We're done. And the second that happened, another half a million appeared um, because there's nothing that like anybody uh, loves more as investors is, is FOMO. Um, so, <laughs> you know, they want to get on the ground floor for this stuff as much as possible. And so, you know, for us just being like, I don't want your money. I'm not interested. Um, like we had people be, you know, like knocking on our door, um, you know, begging us to take their money. Um, and so um, that ended up working out really well for us. But of course we were hitting like regular sales milestones along the way. It took me 18 months to raise that round. Um, so it wasn't quick. Um, but a lot of it was just like us telling people what we were going to do and then executing on it. So saying like, we were going to move into this vertical, we we're going to have this many customers and making sure that like we stayed up all night and we made sure that it happened every single quarter. And if it didn't happen, we had a really good excuse. Um, but like you couldn't let it happen more than one quarter in a row. Um, so we had to show constant growth, constant um, progress in everything that we did. How are you deciding what investors to work with if you said you had more to buy? Yeah, so there were definitely investors that we turned down. Um, the, the thing that I hated the most is like we definitely have investors that acted like the pickup artist, where they like like try and I guess like neg you, make you feel bad about what you're doing. Like you know you're not. They kind of make you feel like oh you're not you're not so hot. You don't know you don't know what you're doing, um, and just like treat us like we were like naive children. Um, and if anybody had that kind of attitude with us, I was not interested. Um, if they didn't get what we were doing as far as our technology and they wanted us to do something completely different, I knew they would never shut up about that. So again, those were not investors that we wanted. Um, you know, if there are investors that were not respectful with our time, like I had one investor where we went to an event and they basically like quartered us and took us to this office and kept us there the entire event. So we only got to talk to them and no other investor. I will never talk to that person again um, because they didn't, they weren't respectful of our time and they made it sound like they were going to invest right away. And then they didn't. Um, and so, you know, I, I can't stand that kind of thing. So we don't, we don't do that. Um, the investors that I really do like um, are value add investors. They introduce us to customers. They introduce us to other investors. Um, they, they pick up the phone when I need advice. Um, a lot of them are former, um, entrepreneurs. Um, so, you know, we have a brand new fund in town called 412 Ventures. They invested in us. And the three principals are all people who have funded and sold businesses here in Pittsburgh, which is a really different environment um, to raise money in or build a company and then say Silicon Valley or New York. But a lot of our money came from outside of the city. So we have investors in Cincinnati, um, Denver, uh, New York, Washington, D.C., Cleveland. Um, the vast majority of our money came from outside of Pittsburgh. My favorite money comes from inside Pittsburgh because I can, people will come to our office and talk to us. And I think that's the best thing um, because you end up getting advisors um, along with uh, the investment. And honestly, if someone's not a good advisor, just don't call them. Um, but a lot of our investors are really, they, they're just, they've seen everything. And even if they haven't you know, done our exact industry, they probably invested in similar um, uh, companies and they've seen things go really well and things go really poorly. And they also have that insider view that they can share with us. How do you feel about board control? Sorry, board control. I, so right now I have my, my, my co-founder and I have complete board control. Um, I love having complete board control. It's the best because uh, it means we retain um, control of the company. So, you know, we get to decide, uh, you know, who we hire, um, you know, we get to decide, um, uh, you know, what kinds of business we're going to go after, how we're going to structure the company, how we're going to be um, strategically, like all the high level stuff, we're the, in the driver's seat. I, I know that that's not something that's not going to last as we raise more money. Um, but if we keep doing a good job, if we keep growing at the rate we're growing, um, we're going to be break even knock wood. Um, I think we're just one deal away from it. So if we are, then like I can take my time with investors and I can say, well, I want, and you can control the terms of the round. And so you can retain um, voter control if you want. Um, and it's tempting to see, when we do this next round, we have to set, you know, negotiate a term sheet. And it's like, I don't know how much leeway I'm going to get from investors and that kind of thing, but I'm going to ask. Um, and they might all say no, but really like you just need like one or two to say yes, <laughs> you know, and have the, the amount of cash where it makes sense. Um, and 
I don't know. So uh, that's that's definitely one of the things I think about a lot um, because I, I like I invented the technology for this company. I built this company. I want to stay in charge of this company for as long as possible. And I definitely hear from a lot of fellow entrepreneurs about how if you know you lose board control and the people on your board don't understand what you're doing or they're not patient. You can end up, you know, being forced to sell the company at a lower valuation than you wanted to just because someone had to close out their fund. Um, and we're trying to be really, really careful about that. And it's something that I think uh, is one of the top things that keeps me up at night. Any other questions? Let's see, we're at... I have a question. Uh, sure. You developed a product at CMU. Uh, did you find your ID? At so, like, while while we did our work, while we were physically present at CMU, we weren't in the lab. It wasn't part of, um, you know, any any work that was funded through CMU or anything that was attached to, you know, any kind of grants in CMU. So it was basically us just sitting in Melonhead. We didn't we didn't even get our like our own office. I'm so jealous of everybody here um, and the resources that are here right now. And we basically just built all our stuff uh, while sitting on a bench. Um, and, you know, while I love CMU and I donate to CMU, um, they, they weren't really a part of our IP. Um, sorry? Uh, what, what did you say? The, the CMU was not a part of okay. building our IP, other than providing us a roof to sit under. Yes? As you iterated through your products, how did you kind of find the next market? That's a good question. Um, so a lot of what we hit, like, uh, honestly, like next markets are all about champions. Um, so you want to find people who really, really care and they care to put their neck on, on the line to um, move you into this next market. Um, and for us, we, we, you know, we dog through the stuff. So we, we know um, our total addressable market across those 20 verticals that we interviewed people in. So we know, you know, our potential market, we know, um, you know, if we have to make any tweaks to the platform, what they have to be for that market. And um, we have to acquire any additional data, where it has to come from. Um, so we have a really clear picture of all of that stuff. Um, but honestly, like, you know, we always talk about the first penguin because we're CMU students. And so it's where you can find that first penguin most of all. Um, for us, now that we're larger and we have a lot more traction, it's a little bit like it's, it's just a lot easier to find those champions and move through organizations because rather than being like, take a chance on us, we're a complete unknown. It's take a chance on us. We've actually done this three or four times and we've gotten these results. And actually, Actually, you're friends with this person because you guys are in the same um, uh, industry and you guys will see each other at this trade show. Why don't you go have lunch with this person and they'll talk about us in a favorable way. So we have a lot of customers who go to bat for us in that way. So do you do most of like customer development or is that kind of word of mouth right now? Um, for us, uh, I mean, word of mouth is a big part of it, but honestly, like uh, trade shows are a really, really big part of our strategy. And we do a ton of marketing right now. So if you look at our website and you look at our Twitter, you'll see that we're constantly generating uh, materials and putting stuff out there. So I, I hired a former romance novelist as like a content writer. She is awesome. Um, and so I, I, it used to be that I had to write all the content and I'm really thankful that it's not me anymore. Any other questions? Great, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Yay. Great.